We thought he was dead already just when he opened the door. We thought he was dead already just when he opened the door. We thought he was dead already just, just when he opened the door. We thought he was dead already just when he opened the door. I had to read it again. And then the paragraph after that, and then go back and read it one more time. Then the two paragraphs after that, then go back again and start all over a couple of more times. There was something condensed uh, in that sentence that, that wouldn't come unpacked. Some pain and meaning and mystery I couldn't understand, wouldn't understand, would only after the 200 some on pages of the singular devastating novel that unrolls back behind it begin to come around to even being able to catch a glimpse of. It had something to do with history and haunting. It had something to do with hunting. It had to do with elk and snowmobiles and a snowstorm that seemed to last a hundred years, lost in time, lost among the dead, lost among the living, alive, uh, sorry, lost in horror and shame and evil and love, a live horse dragging the carcass of a dead horse frozen behind it, which is the past, but also a thing that happens. That happened, a way someone survived, but just barely. The novel is Leadfeather by Stephen Graham Jones, and it is the, one of the most sundering and brutal reading experiences I've ever uh, undertaken, but also one of the most hopeful. Uh, for as much as the novel is about the, the burden of the past and the pain of the present, it's also about a kind of spirit that won't die, that twists out of the car's way at the last minute with a sideways smile, which is maybe a punishment, or maybe it's grace. In any case, it's my pleasure to introduce to you tonight the author of that remarkable novel, uh, remarkable novel, and of 23 or 25 more, according to his website, including The Fast Red Road, Mapping the Interior, Mongrels, Demon Theory, and his latest, The Only Good Indians, which uh, took over my brain by about page six and didn't let go for three days, gave me actual nightmares, and ended with one of the best literary depictions of one-on-one -on -one basketball I've ever read. Um, it's also, you know, uh, Tommy Orange said uh, the book is full of humor and bone chilling images. It both reveals and subverts ideas about contemporary native life and identity. Um, I'll never see an elk or hunting or what a horror novel can do the same way again. Uh, Paul Tremblay called it a masterpiece. Uh, it's got all kinds of great blurbs and it's got, got excellent reviews, deservedly. It's an amazing book. Um, we're immensely grateful and very excited to have Stephen Graham, Graham Jones here with us tonight on Zoom, but alive and well, uh, to share his work with us, to answer any questions we might have, uh, to share his work with us and to answer any questions we might have about werewolves, uh, hair metal, horror and literature, writing, history, the West, and uh, what it's like to bite your own tongue off and have it sewn back on. So Stephen Graham Jones is the Ivana Baldwin Professor of English, as well as professor of, professor, prof, hmm, professor of Distinction at the University of Colorado Boulder. He also has nearly 300 short stories published uh, from literary journals to truck enthusiast magazines, from textbooks to anthologies to best of the year annuals, uh, and then the aforementioned 23 to 25 novels. Jones has been an NEA fellow, a Texas Writers League fellow, has won the Western Literature Association's Distinguished Achievement Award, the Texas Institute of Letters Award for Fiction, the Independent Publishers Multicultural Award, the Bram Stoker Award, four This Is Horror Awards, and has been a Shirley Jackson Award finalist and a Colorado Book Award finalist. And he's had his work named one of Bloody Disgusting's top 10 horror novels of the year. His areas of interest, aside from fiction writing, are horror, science fiction, fantasy film, comic books, pop culture, technology, and American Indian studies. Jones received his BA in English and Philosophy from Texas Tech University in 1994, his MA in English from the University of North Texas in 1996, and his PhD from Florida State University in 1998. Jones' current projects are a paleoanthropological thriller set in Boulder, a slasher, and another slasher. Um, please join me in welcoming, uh, with, with great enthusiasm, uh, Stephen Grams-Jones. Thanks. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Um, 
you know, th thank you for um, bringing up Leadfeather, Roy. That was neat hearing hearing that 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 line. Um, because I think copy editors have beat that way I used to use already. At, like to the two words I always put in the wrong place in sentences are already and still. And I think that's because um, growing up, most of my friends um, spoke Spanish in their homes, and I go to their house and kind of get into their rhythms. And I think when they would um, speak English at school that their syntax that, that would be a little bit beholden to Spanish. And so they would be placing already and still in a slightly different place. And I picked that yeah. up growing up and, um, and copy editors are just always like taking me outside to the parking lot and just beating me senseless about that, you know? And I'm always trying to say, this is how I do it. This is how I do it. And they're always like, no, you don't do it like this. And hopefully they haven't beat it out of me yet, but I'll sometimes worry that it's gone. Sometimes I hear some of my old stuff and I'm like, oh yeah, I used to be able to do that, you know? And it makes me sad that I don't anymore, maybe. <laughs> but also when you were reading that, I really, I remembered um, back when, oh, this is in Facebook days. So I guess Facebook days are persisting. This is, yeah, this is Facebook, this is like probably six or eight years ago. Um, someone had a stack of books. He took a picture of a stack of books and my book was in there. One of my books was in there. And, and they said, um, I've got double copies of all these books. I'm going to give them away to the first person who can guess this, um, this first line. And then he typed in that first line and I jumped in the comments. I'm like, it's this, no, it's this. And I was guessing and he, he like direct messaged me and he said, he said, dude, you got to shut up. You're messing this up. And I was like, I can't play your stupid game. And so then I got back in the comments and I'm trying to play more and he DM me again. He's like, no, I'm serious. You can't do this. And I was like, I don't want your stupid books anyway. So I logged off and, came back that afternoon to see who had won to see what that line was. And it turns out it's one of my lines. I had forgotten that I'd written that first line of a book, you know, um, cause I, I never like write things to keep them in my head. I write them to get them out of my head so I can make room for more bad ideas, you know? Um, but yeah, thank, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Um, I mean, I say here, I'm in my study. I actually spent a lot of time here, but it's an honor to be with y'all anyways, you know, I'm quite, it's quite an honor to, to read to you, to talk to you, to answer some questions. Tonight, I'm going to read three pieces, three short pieces. I will read from, and I have self view off, so I can't see how big this is. I'll read from Night of the Mannequins, my novella that came out like a few days ago. I'll read from The Only Good Indians, a piece I haven't read before out loud. And I'll read from Attack of the 50 Foot Indian, which I can't hold up because it's on a device. It's an um, e-book or an e-story or maybe an e-chat book. I think maybe it's an e-chat book. Um, which, you know, Steve knows stuff about publishing digital only. He was one of the first people I ever knew to do that, you know, way, way back when. It seems like forever ago already, man. Um, but um, I'll jump into it. And um, it's going to be weird, like, um, not hearing y'all. But um, I'll feel like I'm just in my study talking to myself, you know. But let's jump. Let's see. I'll do the story first about that. I'll just do a little piece of it. This is the story is Attack of the 50 Foot Indian. And. I have to look down at the page. Uh, you know, I've tried putting it on screen behind the Zoom, but no matter what, no matter what I try to um, prepare for, it still locks on screen and I'm stuck. So uh, it's a lot safer for me having a physical copy. Attack of the 50 Foot Indian. The first reports to go viral on social media were grainy and honestly looked pretty doctored. A giant unconscious man half in, half out of the Bering Sea. The half of him out of the water was washed up on Siberia. By the time he turned up on higher resolution satellite photos, still just lying there, his face buried in the crook of his right arm as if sleeping one off, a team of Navy SEALs was looping a thick cable on, around one of his submerged ankles. The other end of that cable was hooked into the American submarine, breaking a stack of rec accords and agreements by being this far out of its own waters. It was a gamble. Soldiers' lives hung in the balance, careers back in D.C. were in jeopardy, and scapegoats were already lined up to be fed headfirst to the media. Still, once that submarine's propeller fired up, after a tense moment where the water just churned and bubbled and frothed, the giant unconscious man broke free of the frozen gravel shore and scraped down the long incline into waters where salvage laws could be said to apply. Once out into more neutral depths, he jerked awake all at once and flung his head up for air. And that was when the circling helicopters captured the first high resolution video footage of his long black hair flinging around to clear his face. He bellowed, his massive hand coming up to protect his nose from all this burning seawater. And in doing so, his right arm tangled in the tow cable. The submarine still attached to that cable sloshed back against his hip, knocking him sideways in the water. And he was still looking back at what could have hit him, 
when he slipped under the surface, the ocean floor dropping sharply off right where he was trying to stand. The submarine bobbed for a moment, then was yanked down by the cable still looped around the giant man's ankles. The surface of the Bering Sea smoothed back out as if no international incident had almost happened. In the minutes before the ripples from that dunking amplified into the waves that would wash up into five o'clock traffic in Nome, every phone in every government office lit up, each of them demanding explanation. Had this giant man been a normal-sized person who had somehow grown into this behemoth? Had he fallen from somewhere? Had he swum up from the depths? Were Leviathans supposed to have tentacles, though? Was he a decoy of some sort, maybe? If so, to what purpose? Could this be an art installation, a Trojan horse situation? But what technology could make him seem so alive? Was he even human? How could he be? And what was with all that hair? The video footage was zapped back to the mainland, slowed down enough to capture the geometry of his face, the set of his eyes, those cheekbones, and, and the color of his skin. He wasn't simply burned or tanned from lying in the winter sun without clothes, which had been the initial supposition at the Pentagon. That was his natural complexion. Was he Indian? If so, American or Asian, but why not Polynesian or Saudi Arabian or Mexican or Mayan or Hawaiian or African? And taking the region into account, shouldn't he be Inuit or Inupiaq, Aleut or Samoid? But none of them are that tall, are they? All this speculation in approximately 12 minutes and 37 seconds. It was stopped by the giant man surfacing again with a desperate gasp. The water surging around him. He was sitting astride the submarine, which was rocking back and forth, finding its level. This was important because now his waist and pelvis and smooth upper thighs were heaving into view between the waves. He wasn't wearing a thobe or board, board shorts or muslin pants or any kind of brightly colored wrap or grass skirt. He was in what looked to be a, a loincloth. So he is Indian, a con officer said, rocking with the submarine like he just inserted a quarter for this ride. Is that okay to say? The staff sergeant listening in asked all around. Never mind that, the three-star general sit behind her said, clicking the DEF CON dial over two whole notches at once. What century is this so-called Indian supposed to be from? More important, his staff was already asking, what animal could that loincloth have been made from? There was no apparent stitching or seams. This is a small strip of an even larger piece of leather. But what animal even approached that size? None. It would take multiple moose for a garment of that length, and you can't really make leather from the skin of a blue whale. The Indian didn't care. Then he goes on to King Kong his way across America, as you do when you're a giant, you know? Um, and of course, people are shooting at him. That's what people do to Indians and giants, you know? Um, I'll read now from the very front of, I don't know how big this is, from Night of the Mannequins, which is a novella. It came out from Tor.com, shoot, September 1st. This is the 9th, I guess eight days ago. I can actually do math in public. It's crazy. Um, it's set down in Rockwall, Texas. And making sure, yeah, I got my, I'm always like terrified that one of the pages is going to have been torn out in the last like five minutes and I'm going to stumble and not know what to do. But they're all there. So that doesn't, doesn't need to be set up really. This is just chapter one. So Shanna got a new job at the movie theater. We thought we'd play a fun prank on her and now most of us are dead and I'm really starting to feel kind of guilty about it all. I like to say it wasn't my idea that we all thought of it spontaneously just started saying parts of the prank out loud that jigsawed together in the air. One quarter my plan, a quarter Danielle's, Tim and JR completing, uh, competing to finish out the rest. It was kind of only me though. Let me explain. First, Shanna's job at the movie theater, the big one down by the lake. Her mom was making her do it. Not work, Shanna's had jobs since she was in junior high, but working there specifically. Her checks going straight home to pay for what happened to their side lawn which is a whole different thing and not my fault at all, not completely. The reason it was that movie theater and not the dollar show or the drive-in or the even bigger Cineplex further down 30 towards Dallas was first, it was that that one's the main one in Rockwall and closest, but second and probably the real reason, Shanna's mom had dated that theater's main security guard in high school and he could keep an eye on his long ago ex-girlfriend's daughter, he thought. Two weekends in, Shanna used her usher powers to sneak us in the emergency exit at the back of Theater 14, the last one on that side, and the farthest from the ma manager's offices, which is where our security was. It was less because we wanted to see, 
a movie than what we wanted then that we wanted the thrill of not paying for the movie you know anyway with assigned seating we were having to move the four of us to a new place with about every third clump of people who came in it was kind of a giveaway ended up with the assistant manager coming in to count heads and us claiming we'd thrown our ticket stubs away already who keeps ticket stubs the only problem was we couldn't remember where our seats had been it probably would have worked or it could have worked but then the assistant manager asked us what movie this even was. Surely we knew that, right? Not really. Worse, it turned out to be a senior citizen kind of movie. Four old dudes escaping their nursing homes and do doting children in county jail situations to have one last golf game, which was when we all kind of shrugged and gave up. Better to get busted than claim having wanted to see that. Because we were sophomores, the same as Shanna, it didn't take long before they were asking her questions about did she maybe know us. Of course, we all temp unfriended her while being perp walked out, but that didn't erase snapshots and there were a lot of those. Even under the filters and markups, it was kind of obviously the five of us from elementary on up until this very night, including one group selfie from our stolen seats posted right on her timeline. So the result of us sneaking in and not knowing to sit in the very front row until the show started was A, Shanna would now work in tandem with a more trusted experience provider. And B, there would be random head counts of all movies she was either in charge of cleaning or seating. It was bullshit, especially since she could be making more in tips at the car wash with Danielle. Because of the porta potty situation, girls didn't work there so much. They pulled tens and even twenties sometimes. But she still had 600 to go and pay in her mom's landscaping, landscaping tab. Well, she was stuck. Anyway, the prank. JR lives kind of out in the sticks, right? Wed on Rabbit Ridge, technically in Heath. Back behind his fence, there's this big hill we used to always roll down in boxes. Stupid kid stuff pretty much turned us into instant trigger bait. So we were looking like we had pimples before we even really had them. Anyway, in sixth grade, Tim was go going for the record in his box and it crashed him through the trees into the dark, stinky muck of the creek that had never been actual water, had always been just mud. None of us went in there anymore since Danielle had gotten poison oak or ivy or we didn't know. So we were all standing there waiting when Tim came back limping, bleeding from the forehead and carrying a pale white arm, kind of bent in cheery fashion at the elbow. We braved the woods to see the rest of this. There in the black slime of the creek bed was a naked white mannequin, this giant Ken doll reaching for the sky with the one arm he had left. You better believe he was our toy for that whole summer. We traded him between our houses, carrying him a piece at a time, bungee corded to skateboards and bikes, or stuffed halfway into a camping backpack. We stole our dad's clothes to dress him up, leave him here and there. He had so many names, but he was finally just Manny for, you know, mannequin. Real clever, I know. When we finally got bored with him, he ended up in my garage, straddling the Kawasaki 750 my dad had laid over, the motorcycle forbidden by my mom from ever being ridden again. But that didn't mean dad had to sell it which is a whole thing with them, but never mind. So Manny was a joke from when we'd been kids, before life had gotten all serious and SAT. Me having the idea to bring him back for this perfect prank was a way of honoring the kids we'd been, I figured. And it would be one last blast for Manny. Better, Shanna would get the joke right off. That was very important. It was kind of how we'd be telling her we were sorry for the hot water at her new job. Well, and for the landscaping she was paying off with that job too, for a lot of stuff, okay? I mean, she'd always been the toughest of us, the meanest when she needed to be, the least likely to cry or complain about cuts or scrapes, the best at earning Wood Scouts badges. But that didn't mean she didn't like nice things too, we figured. Like being included in a prank to end all pranks, the one that could someday summarize our whole high school experience and right now blast us off into the future in the most fitting way. So we raided our dad's closets again and dug into the costume truck in our old fort that nobody found yet, way back in the trees behind Holy Trinity. We were needing clothes for Manny, but for us as well. We were going 90s baggy for that Friday night. Danielle shoved a whole mannequin arm down the leg of the pants she was wearing, which kind of made us all look away, but not look away. I mean, okay, Danielle was always just one of us, a girl, yeah, whatever, but she'd never been like a dating prospect, right? Mostly because none of us were dating, didn't need boyfriends or girlfriends since we had each other. Or maybe we just didn't have the nerve. We're hiding in the safety of friendship. I don't know. It doesn't matter now. And Shanna was like my third cousin or something anyway. But Danielle, the thing with her, why she'd never been in the realm of possibility, 
it was probably that we'd all seen each other with snotty noses in elementary. We'd all ridden the Acne Highway of junior high together, and now we were telling each other horror stories about the swarm of college questions constantly spewing up from the mouths of grandparents and family friends. It's like we were too close for anything romantic, if that makes sense. Any of us going out with any of the rest of us had never been a real consideration, or even a distant maybe. Still, seeing that mannequin arm reach down the front of her pants, I had to look, I had to kind of look far, far away. I don't know about Tim and JR. Then she did the same with the other arm and tied bandanas around her thighs to keep the arms in place. And part of me was wondering why we hadn't been playing this particular game for a long time already. So um, it won't be long till everybody's dead. That's what happens in a horror novella. You know, there aren't part twos to horror novellas generally. Um, because it's a big pile of bodies at the end. I'm gonna read from The Only Good Indians here, which is a novel, it's a novel about four guys who go out for elk, and that's the part I'm gonna read, the going out for elk part. They go out for elk, and they think it's their last day to hunt, and all the bets, all like all bets are off, which I think it says in the section I'm gonna read. Like when it's the last day to hunt, you think I've put in my miles walking. So anything I do now to fill my freezer is the right thing. You know, so you can get involved in not the most ethical behavior or relationship with animals in the land. And um, they do something they shouldn't do. They commit a trespass against um, the elk, against their community. And they, they walk away from that day for 10 years and it's really far in their rearview mirror, at which point something stands up and starts hunting them back. They're having to pay for what they've done, you know? And there's a lot of basketball too. No basketball in this part. The sky was spitting these hard little snowballs that kept catching in Lewis's girly eyelashes that he always thought were maybe just normal eyelashes. Wearing mascara now, princess? Gabe asked all the same, bumping over into him gonna bat your eyes bring all the big bulls to your door you should talk Lewis said lifting his chin to Gabe's own frosted eyelashes off res people always used to default think that Lewis and Gabe were brothers Gabe at 6'2 had always been a touch taller but otherwise yeah sure in John Wayne's day Lewis and Gabe would have been scooped up to die in a hail of gunfire would have been Indians 16 and 17 or 40 Cass though Cass would have been more the sitting in front of the lodge type the made for the 20th century type Maybe even already wearing some early version of John Lennon shades. Ricky, he'd be Bluto from Popeye, just darker. Put him in front of a camera, and all he could hope to play would be the Indian thug off to the side that nobody trusts to remember even half a line. Of Lewis and Gabe and Cass, though, he was the only one who could struggle out a sort of beard if he made it through the itchy part and didn't have a girlfriend at the time. Custer in the woodpile was the excuse he would always give, smoothing his rangy 14 hairs down along his cheeks like Grizzly Adams. Gabe leaned across to Lewis, making smooch smoochy lips, saying a little flirting would probably work better than what we're, but then Cass, ahead of them at the truck, raised his left hand, silencing them. What you got, Ricky asked, coming back. He was always ranging out to the side, sure they were just missing a whole herd, that all the elk were single, single filing it past just out of sight, ducking their heads down so their racks wouldn't crest over the snow. Shh, Cass said, coming down to one knee to read sign like a real Indian. Tracks. Elk had been nosing into the bed, probably remembering that some trucks carry hay and hay never gets all the way gone. Not without elk that are tall enough to lean over the side of the truck. They'd have long enough necks to even get under the toolbox for every last straw. Heavy guys, Gabe said, lowering down to insert a trigger finger into the deep hoof print. He had some complicated method where a bull weighed this much if it was up to his second knuckle, that much if it was halfway past that, but Lewis never bought it. Told you they were up here, Ricky said, looking all around like these elk might be turned around at the tree line like a stupid white tail to twitch their tails and watch. Up here, it wasn't high, high, snowmobile or horse country, but halfway there anyway, just down from Bab over toward Duck Lake. With the weather moving in, the elk should have been filing down from the timber to wait the big snow out. The idea was to meet them halfway. This is some bullshit, Kat said, his usual call. And Ricky responded with his obligatory line, literally towing over a fresh black mound, the pellets more tapered at one end, not both. Nine times out of nine, that'll mean bull, not cow. They're playing with us, Gabe said, reseating his rifle strap on his shoulder. Catch me if you can, Lewis said for the bulls, 
and then lined up on the walking away tracks, his eyes going downhill with them, downhill to shit, Cass said, turning around to kick snow. They know, Ricky said with a chuckle, impressed. Trixie, Trixie, Lewis said, smacking his gum too loud. And Cass cut his eyes over at him, not sure he'd heard that word right, but not wanting to ask either. Gabe didn't say anything, just kept watching where the big bulls had gone, where they were. Anybody pack some gray braids in with their bear kit? He finally said with his trademark grin. The one that usually ended up either getting beat in by the end of the night or looking out through bars, sometimes both. A hundred years ago, he would have been the guy always trying to get a raiding party together, sneak over the line, have some fun, come hell for leather home in the morning with half of America masked up right behind. No, man, Ricky said, his eyes hot so he could really mean this, really drill it in. If we get caught over there, it's, then let's not get caught. What say, Gabe said, looking from face to face like polling a jury. We can't, Lewis said to Gabe about the off-limits section. Ricky's right. If Denny catches us again, then he'll. It's not fair, though, Cass whined, flicking something off the end of his finger and watching it fly. That section's reserved for elders, but what if none of the elders are even hunting it, right? Old guys get up early, Gabe threw in, like just seeing this brilliant point. If they were going to hunt their section today, they'd already have been and gone. We'll just be cleaning up the ones they weren't going to shoot. No big. Cassidy's right. Cass, Cass said, whoever he is today, he's right, Gabe corrected, setting his feet to take Cass's elbow. It wasn't that the elders section was all the way off limits. It was that only elders, plus one and only one, could use trucks to get in and out. Anybody younger was supposed to hoof it, which would be a two-hour walk in at least, and it was already an hour and a half after lunch, with the sun going down just after four and taking the thermometer with it. Elders aren't the only ones with empty freezers, Cass said with an obvious shrug. Anyway, it's my truck. You three bail. I'll take the heat. When Ricky didn't say anything, Lewis just looked away down to the elders section again. It was some good-ass country around Duck Lake. No two ways about that. And Gabe knew every logging road, every two-track, every old game trail that had been widened out by four-wheelers and chainsaws. And it does suck to be the only Indian without an elk. Last day of the season, Gabe pled to all of them. Technically, it wasn't, but it was the last time they could come out for a whole Saturday like this together. There would still be lunch breaks on their own, though, eating and driving down some road somebody maybe saw an elk walking alongside. There would still be being late to work because of a set of deep tracks crossing from ditch to ditch. But Lewis heard what Gabe was saying, what he was arguing. The last day of the season, the rules are different. Anything goes. Whatever fills your freezer. You've put in enough days out in the cold and the snow that you feel like the elk owe you almost. Included in that are any moose or mealies you might jump along the way. Shit, Lewis said, because he could feel himself starting to cave. And then all the bad thinking starts, or it keeps on going, maybe. Thank y'all for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll clap. Uh, <laughs> take that as a stand-in for, for everyone. There's some visual <laughs> clapping going on. Um, thank you so much. Uh, that was, that was, uh, that was great. And it's so great to, to hear your voice, uh, reading that work. Uh, I'm sure, uh, I, there's some, there's questions. I know Steve, Steve mentioned he's got some of them. I'm going to take the, uh, um, you know, organizer's prerogative and, and start off, uh, and give people a chance to sort of think, think about it a little bit, but it's maybe a little softball. Um, I've been reading a lot of um, Sam Delaney lately, uh, Samuel Delaney and, and uh, both fiction and criticism and sort of thinking about the different kinds of uh, things you can do with different genres, right? And I was wondering if you, if you might be willing to talk about like what sort of, what sort of privilege access does horror give you to reality? Like what kinds of writing can you do with horror that, that or you know, our, harder to I, do I remember, other things? You know, when I came to grad school, um, I never like even knew what grad school was, even when I was an undergrad. And when, when my professors got me to go to grad school, I agreed to go. Like my deal I made in my head was I'll go to grad school if I can go in ninja mode. And what that meant for me was I'm sneaking in to steal all the craft I can to port it back out to the genres I love, like Westerns, horror, science fiction, fantasy. And but then I got to grad school and um, fell in love with a whole different set of cats and ran with them for a while, like Thomas Pynchon and um, Gerald Visner, you know, and that was a ball and I, they're still part of my DNA, of course. Then I 
you know, I got out of grad school and I act like it's an escape. I guess I graduated is what you say it. <laughs> and, um, and the first novel I wrote was a fast red road. And then the second novel I wrote was um, demon theory, a horror novel. And what was so liberating about demon theory was that um, when a character started being problematic, I could just like eviscerate them. You know, I could just like, put them in a meat grinder and they just come out as chum and everything's fine. That's expected in the genre. Whereas if I'm not in horror and a character starts to get problematic, I'm like, I got to deal with you for the next 200 pages, you know, but in horror, I feel like the special privilege I get in horror is I can get rid of characters in pretty fantabulous ways. And it's really kind of fun. Um, but that's not exactly what you're asking. Of course. Um, I think, um, horror, allows me as a writer to know my characters um, in the most intense moments when they reveal who they truly are. And I think once somebody has revealed who they truly are, then I can tell a better story because I'm no longer trying to um, disguise who they are or figure out who they are. And um, so once they are who they are and they're running away from a monster in a mine shaft or whatever's going on, I feel like um, the story moves better or it's either it moves better or it better syncs up with the way I think stories work, you know, and which effect, the effect of that is it moves better for me anyways, you know. Great. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, Although Samuel Delaney, he's, he's, I'm sure he's got like a much more intelligent question. That dude's got, he's like a walking, he's like a brain on legs, you know, he, he can. Yeah. Uh, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's um, you know, he's a, uh, he's in his own class. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Whatever he's doing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for that. Um, I have more questions, um, you know, about all different kinds of things, uh, mm -hmm. but I want to step back and uh, um, give other folks a chance. So just a reminder, if you want to ask a question, uh, let's raise your hand or um, do it, put it in the, uh, in the chat. There's a couple up now. And so we'll start with um, Azarine. Az uh, Azarine, you've got a question. You want to go ahead? Yeah, sure. I mean, there, there may be people ahead of me in the chat, but um, thank you so much, Stephen, for being here with us. That was really wonderful, and Roy for organizing. I was just thinking about the way that landscape and characters interact in your work. I think it's just kind of the descriptions and the way that the violence is layered is incredibly powerful, and it kind of gives me the feeling when I'm reading your work that the past is always um, expressing itself in those encounters and in those clashes, the, the body sort of um, making its way through the water or the encounters with the elk and the anticipation of, of some, some terrible thing unfolding. And I was wondering what your relationship is to allegory um, as a kind of maybe more ancient engagement with horror and um, I'm asking that particularly because there's something obviously very existential and philosophical that's occurring in those passages right that's just buried right beneath the surface um, um, yeah I mean I, I do feel like fiction is always like um, using a sharp finger to scratch down a tight surface and hope it peels open enough that something real like some sort of archetype the archetypes that are always like surging and undulating back and forth can surface for a moment, you know, and like a Leviathan or something and, and grab hold of us. Um, my relationship with allegory is that unless somebody's just said it like you just did, then I always say allegory and everybody always laughs, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like, um, what's the other word? Seg, segue. I always say segue seg because I read that word so many, many, so many times before I heard it said. And the same way with misled. I used to think misled was misled, you know? Um, and so alleg allegory, is that, did I say it right? Is that right? Allegory? Yeah, allegory. Is that right? Am I saying it wrong? Is everybody laughing? Is that's right? <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, allegory. Um, allegory. Oh, yeah. <laughs> allegory um, my relationship with it is fraught as you can tell um but yeah I do think that horror is um I mean well you know for horror to be scary for it for it to scare the reader it has to scare me first and for me to be scared then it has to 
operate number one at the level of this is a real werewolf, this is a real vampire, whatever it is, you know, I have to like, I have to believe intellectually and emotionally in the bad stuff going on on the page. I have to believe enough that um, I don't know, I can't see myself, but I've got curtains on my windows over here because I, I get terrified that there's going to be like a monster just watching me through the third pane, you know, and I'm, so I believe in it totally. I don't believe just a little, I believe totally. And therefore I write books fast because books to me, are just like dark tunnels that I'm trapped in and I have to run for the light, you know? But um, I don't think I'm answering your question even remotely. I'm just kind of going off the word allegory, allegory. I did it, I did it on my own, allegory. I feel like I'm made, I, I, I can be a PhD now finally after all these years, right? Um, um, I think my, my relationship is that when there is something there, when there is like a consistent system that works kind of behind what I'm doing, then it's luck, you know? I think if I try to stage it, then it's gonna fall apart. I, that's what I've found in all of my fiction, all of my projects, is that when I try to do something, it breaks. The only way anything good ever happens is when I luck into it, you know? So any allegory that is happening is just either me being lucky or my editor being smart, I think, mm -hmm. you know? Well, it does, it does feel like it's emerging naturally from, from mm -hmm. the text in the sense that there's the, the, the sort of scale of the characters encountering mm -hmm. the violence, but then there's yeah. also a commentary on his, history and, yeah. and landscape and memory, right? So that's where yeah. I made that it, link, but thank for you. For sure, I mean, yeah, I mean, um, like we all have our own like um, little grievances with the world and we can't help but filter that onto the page through our fingertips when we write of course and i've got my own sets of grievances against the world and if there is like a something operating like a like i don't know plato's cave or something like a level up from what i'm doing it is because my grievances are the same throughout the whole book or the whole story or something you know and you asked about place too i didn't even talk about place um I mean, The Only Good Indians was always set around Browning, or at least in Montana. This book, Mad the Mannequins, I initially wrote it placeless. And, um, and then I sent it to Ellen Datlow, and she said, I like it. It's scary, but you have to put it in a specific place. And I wrote back and said, do I? And she said, you do. And I was like, I wrote back, you know, really? And uh, I didn't want to do it at all. Um, not because it was work, but because I was just happy with it. But she told me to plant it somewhere. And so I planted it in Rockwall, Texas, which I kind of know. And she was right. It came alive in a completely different way. You know, like I was able to, the, the novel, the novella became informed by the attitudes of kids I'd kind of had tangential um, awareness of in Rockwell, you know, and it just made it more real, you know, and I wrote this novel, what, in 2018, 2017, something like that. And I should have known better because in 2016, I wrote this big sprawling crime novel and I wrote it very self-consciously against like a the backdrop of a place I kind of in my head called City X, like this Kafka, like cardboard cutout city or something, you know? And and I, I I guess I thought I was being Kafka. I don't know what's going through my head when I do stuff. And um, but I'm not I don't think I'm ever being Kafka, don't get me wrong. Um and I got about 120 pages into that book. And it was like pushing the snowball uphill. It was, and that never happens in my books. My books are always a race. They're never like a struggle. And I, and I thought, is this, what, is this what people call writer's block? Is, is it, am I, have I finally um, caught that thing or whatever? And, um, and while I was trying to figure out, navigate that, that obstacle or whatever it was, I got called to a book festival back in my hometown in West Texas. And my first thought when I got there was people read in my hometown. I had no idea people read where I'm from, you know, but um. The second thing was, as they were chaperoning me around from event to event, I got to looking out the windows and I realized this is the backdrop for that novel. And so I went home after that weekend and started over at page one. Well, it kind of started over re 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 like a really deep revision. And I made it be in my hometown and the novel just told itself for like 150,000 words. And I, for some reason, it took me like um, that, that was probably like the 30 odd 35th novel or something I've written I don't know why it took me that long to figure out that place is a character you know and and also I have no idea why just like eight months later I forgot that so I'm probably going to forget it again so thank you for asking maybe I'll remember it for like 20 seconds or something you know <laughs> that'll be wonderful um thanks uh yeah I I 
you know, I feel like I'm always, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm nowhere written nowhere near as much as, as you, but I feel like I'm always like relearning the same things over and over mm-hmm. again. Um, we have a question from uh, Chris Peterson. Chris, do you want to ask your question or do you want me to read it out for you? Are you there? Chris? Yeah. Could, could you read it, please? Yeah, sure, sure. So the question is, uh, I'm struck at how similar the words you read from The Attack of the 50 Foot Indian are to The Handsomest Drowned Man in the World by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Also, how different they are. In Garcia Marquez's story, Esteban, the drowned man, inspires rather than frightens the people who find him. Did his story inspire yours? You know, until you read that question, I forgot about that story, but now I'm starting to remember it. And it's weird because I've been kind of staging a, a surprise attack on one of Marquez's stories. I want to redo it in like my own way, you know, but I want to do it very consciously so everybody knows that it's Marquez and I'm not actually trying to pretend like I'm the first person to think of this, but maybe, maybe attacking a 50 foot Indian was my first kind of, um, I was kind of bombing myself to the fact that I was doing that. I have no idea. I'm, I need to go back and look at that story though. Great. Um, and a question from uh, Tamara Loggins. Uh, Tamara, do you want to uh, read your question or, should, or ask your question or should I read it for you? Feel free. Okay. <laughs> uh, in one of your recent interviews, you mentioned that you're currently working on a TV show script and a movie script. In what ways has the writing process differed between writing scripts for the screen and a movie? Did you find that the way you wrote Demon Theory and The Last Final Girl prepared you for this. Um, thank you first, Tamara, for knowing those books. Um, I love to hybridize screenplay format with um, traditional like novelistic narrative or whatever we call it. Um, um, you know, and, and to answer the question, I guess I have to differentiate between features and television because those, as I'm finding, are done in completely different ways. The result looks the same at arm length, but man, it's a different, it's a different thing to do. Um, the trick with television is, um, the writing process seems to be, be very discussion oriented, if that makes sense. It's like a group think, you know, and that, that's not, that produces wonderful stuff. There's, there's great stuff in the other room on my television. It produces wonderful stuff. It's not what I'm used to at all. Um, like we all, we all, I mean, one thing I always tell my workshop students is that, um, we can ask, we can nitpick your story to death, but what really matters is is your story a mechanism that triggers a thought or an emotion? That's the only real question that matters. You know, we can ask, what do they do on their 17th birthday? Or what kind of car do they drive? All that stuff. And it doesn't, it doesn't, I mean, as long as the story triggers that emotion or that feeling or that thought, that that's good enough, you know? Um, but in television, it seems to be as near as I'm, it, what I'm finding out is that television is different. In television, you have to understand that when you do something, and act, if you pull a lever in act two of episode three, then it's gonna make a dim light bulb go off in episode nine, act, act four, you know? And you have to have prepared for that. And that way of, um, maybe it's a way of seeing everything all at once. That's what, that's, not, that's what I'm not used to. You were asking about, you were talking, Roy, you were talking about Lead Feather. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll give an example of what I mean by seeing it all at once. Lead Feather was a novel which I wrote, I, my whole plan the whole way through, was it's gonna end um, at this regional basketball tournament where this one guy, Thomas White Elk, jumps up off the baseline, makes a pretty little jump shot. And, um, and, I, and then I finally got to that moment and Thomas White Elk jumps up and makes that shot. It was just completely boring. And I'm like, I did all this work for a boring end and this didn't get me anywhere. And so I, I piled everybody into a car to truck them home. And then while they're going home, a girl stands up from the ditch and she must have been there all along, but I have no idea because I can't see the whole thing, you know, or it's like I have to blind myself to some parts or else I'll aim too much for them, if that makes sense. And um, and there, what I'm saying, I guess, is in television writing, I feel like um, I'm such an obvious aimer that everybody's going to get it if I do this thing in um, act two of episode three, you know, it's going to be like telegraphed. And I think it really won't be because there's layers and layers of that story has to bubble up through to get to the audience and it's going to change in a variety of ways. But I think that's my fiction writer's fear anyways, if that makes sense. Whereas features, features, I like features. I mean, features go through 
revisions after revisions and they get story notes from like everybody like somebody's like the studio exec's cousin will have something to say and you have to incorporate that too which is kind of you know arbitrary and random it feels like but um at the end of the day you're generally the one in charge of your pass anyways and it feels more like features feel more like writing a novel to me which is a weird thing to say because to tell you the truth a novel like the scope of a novel feels more like a season of television, whereas a novella feels more like a feature film. But the creation of them is completely something that I'm having to find my feet in, you know? Um, thanks. Uh, uh, next question from uh, Jennifer Juskowitz, Jus which, uh, sorry, I'm uh, mispronouncing your last name. Um, Jennifer, would you like to, to read your question or uh, would you like me to? I can read it. Um, so I've read as much as I can, uh, including one of your students' blogs and your promo materials about the class you teach at the Stanley Hotel during your winter mm -hmm. term. Mm -hmm. um, I'm super interested in your pedagogy for this. How do you mm -hmm. think that the setting affects how the students write or what they write for that class? And mm -hmm. I've also read as much as I can about the um, admittedly troubled Stanley Horror Writers Retreat that Cavender put together. And I'm wondering if your decision to take your class there was because of um, how successful that was in many ways, or if you'd kind of always wanted to go there. Um, well, first, I'd never always wanted to go there. I always like, I, it, I mean, you want to go there, you want to touch the grail, you know, that's um, room 237 or it's 217, whether it's the novel or the, or the movie, um, or the Kubrick movie, I should say. Um, but I, as for wanting to be there, like, because I was kind of, because um, I was the instructor, they let me stay in room 217, the, you know, the supposedly haunted room, which really, that's just the idea, that's just the room that King and his wife slept in or something, but, um, and so I'm a super spooky person, like, I get scared, I get scared taking the trash out if it's after dark, I'm just like, I'll just live with this trash overnight, you know, I'll be okay, but, um, and so me sleeping in 217 was probably not the best idea because I hardly slept for what, seven, eight days or something, you know, so I was coming to class in this fog of insomnia, you know, and terror and everything. And I'm sure my hair looked weird too, because they didn't have a real shower. They just have like a, one of those wands or whatever. And it was, it was a, it's a neat room. Don't get me wrong. But it's also a room you have to like stage your exits from because there's always a tour group standing in front of your room, you know, and there's always a tour guide explaining all the scary stuff. And, and so I have to like watch the people for a window and then I run out, you know? Um, but as for why the Stanley, it actually wasn't my choice. The um, CU said, Hey, do you want to teach a course at the Stanley? And I said, why not? I actually only did that twice. I haven't done it for probably three years, I guess. As for the other workshop that had happened there, I, I didn't know about it when I started doing it. And as I understand that one kind of, people have told me it kind of blew up or something like something went bad. I don't, I don't, I don't know the details, but I know that it's kind of got a bad legacy or history or something. Ours went great. I'm still friends with a lot of the students who were in it. It was a mix of like probably a third CU student and then just people from all over the world coming in to, um, to take the course. And man, it was just so much fun. We would do screenings every night. We would bring in um, people from Denver, you know, agents or editors and to just to talk to us. And um and we got to move among the Stanley and it was really cool. I really liked it a lot. And maybe I'll do it again someday. The trick is how will I sleep? That's why I quit doing it. Cause I had to sleep at some point, you know, I used to think I didn't, but I actually do as, as I found out. I'm, and watching scary movies every night does not lend itself to sleeping in room 217 <laughs> to me anyways. <laughs> I had, I had one terrifying experience there. I was like, this is my second time there. I had, I had figured out that the like conference room chairs were not comfortable to watch movies in. So I brought myself a lawn chair and one of those bags. And so I'm traipsing down the second floor from room 217 to the room we called the movie room, which was one of the conference rooms and had my, my um, bag, bag chair over my shoulder. And, um, and I get a sense that something's walking beside me and I jerk around and it's gone and I jerk around and I'm like, Oh crap, I'm being stalked by a ghost or paced by a ghost really. And after a few times, I finally just gave up, and I'm like, I'm, hopefully they don't bite me, you know. I just, so I made all the way down the hall, took the stairs, and on the stairs there's a mirror, 
And when I rounded into the mirror, which was always a terrifying moment for me because I'm terrified of big mirrors, you know, I went around the corner, I see that um, red head I'd been seeing behind me and it was my own bag chair over my shoulder, you know, <laughs> so that's what I'd been running from. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we'll take one more, one more question. Does that, does that work for you? Oh, I'm, I'm here forever long. Y'all need me. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, Melanie Page, uh, has a question. Uh, do you want, do you want to ask your question, Melanie, or shall oh, I I'll talk? I'm not shy. First okay. off, Jennifer Yuskevich, blast from the past. Wow. Okay. So, um, when I first encountered your work in the Notre Dame MFA program back in like 2008 or nine, it was at an a AWP conference in Chicago and you were reading mm -hmm. from Leadfeather cause it had just come out mm -hmm. with FC2. Mm -hmm. And so my first impression of your work was like, this is an academic person. And since mm -hmm. then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just like up to my eyebrows and like the book blogging world and all those folks, and they're just totally fangirling over you. Mm -hmm. And so you've got these two very different audiences going on. And I was wondering, like, um, because you write so much, do you ever kind of cater to an audience, like for what they maybe hope, or do you ever write for a specific publisher? I think I thought, I think I heard that somewhere with the, metal shark teeth book that maybe you wrote that yeah and then or are you doing yeah. it a different way you know with the zombie sharks with metal teeth collection i did collect that was for a bizarro a bizarro press and so i did pull together the stories um that i thought were the weirdest and most outlandish so th those were kind of they weren't written for a bizarro press but they were the most bizarro adjacent stories i had anyways you know the ones that didn't fit anywhere else like um one one example is um, a guy goes to meet his girlfriend's parents and his parents are Muppets, you know, or maybe they're Muppets. It's it's a hard call. Um, stuff like that, which I have a lot of fun. I had a, fun, a lot of fun with that book. I feel kind of bad that there's not actually any zombie sharks with metal teeth in there. But what are you going to do? It was a fun title, you know. <laughs> um, um, I do feel like the three books I did with FC2 that I kind of wrote with FC2's like ethos or aesthetic in mind, you know, or I know that the that FC2 would tolerate these shenanigans i guess <laughs> you know if that makes sense and i have a lot of shenanigans um um or you know i think i do anyways or i think i can pull them off sometimes but um yeah you're right starting at about um 2005 2006 i kind of became two writers i feel like um i was doing kind of what people called literary or something like that and then i was also doing horror or genre stuff anyways and um and the reason I did that was because my first couple of novels, I do book events and people just ask me questions about the Blackfeet or about American Indians like history or um, the identity politics or anything like that. And I'm like, I, I, it felt like they weren't interfacing the, the book as art, the books as art. It felt like they were using the book as a lens to focus on issues, you know, and I didn't like that at all. And I saw, I said, screw y'all, I'm gonna go write horror. You know, I'll have a good time over here and try to try to ask those questions about this vampire novel or whatever. <laughs> and, but the trick was, I still had that other like impulse in me too, to do weird stuff, you know? And, and so I, I started doing horror novels or genre novels anyways, but I was also doing like weird stuff like um, The Long Trial of Nolan Dugatti, you know, which is a, a weird, a pretty weird thing. It's got a giant invisible time traveling caterpillar in it, you know, but those, those kind of shenanigans. And then long about 2016, or really 2014, I guess, I wrote a novel, Mongrels. And in Mongrels, uh, I just, I, I, I was able to use a non-traditional form, these um, first person standalone stories bracketed with third person flash fictions that all kind of balled into a single narrative, luckily, you know? and. I was able to use also the um, creatures that are closest to my heart being a lifelong diehard horror fan. And I felt like Mongrels when it came out in 2016 kind of knitted me back together. Like I had been two writers for a long time and then I became one writer again, which felt like so whole. I didn't realize that it was weird being two people. I don't know why, why I didn't realize that. And, and so then I get to do novels now that are everything I want to do. They're, they're doing weird stuff with form, but they're also horror. And, as, as far as I can tell, that's what I'm going to keep doing. I finally figured out how to be a single person instead of two people. You know? <laughs> well, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's a remarkable, 
It's a it's a really incredible book. Uh, I'm you know I'm glad that it also has solved your you know psychic bifurcation. Um, uh, or I guess it was mongrels that solved that. Um, yeah, I I'm. Uh, oh, Steve, Steve has a question. Steve, Steve, has, Steve a question. has a question. You got your hand up, Steve. Sorry. Yeah, you you pre, you kind of answered my question, I think, because I was going to ask that very sort of thing in terms of like the genres. I mean, I've always like admired this ability of yours to just sort of skate across genres, uh, and you do that within individual works as well, you know. And so, partly, I was going to, you know, just ask how, how you know you kind of decide whether to write like a whole. How does a book become like a horror novel or else like a more experimental sort of thing yeah. or something like that? You know, but, I, oh, no, no, finish. Well, I was going to say, I also, I also have like a dumb question, so mm -hmm. maybe you can, mm -hmm. you know, pick either one of these. But, you know, I, my, my introduction to your stuff was, was through, you know, FC2 and the Lead mm -hmm. Feather. And, uh, and, and I've always kind of wanted to ask you this. Uh, you know, there's always that, so you always, your work's always kind of compared with the magical realist kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but I was wondering, like, um, if there's any, uh, like, old man coyote in there. Because, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, it, I, I'm always struck by, you know, your stuff in a way is kind of, you got these trickster figures, in, mm -hmm. in, but not in the way that people traditionally think of that, you know. And, but it is like these kind of shape-shifting yeah. animals and, uh, you know, something... Yeah will turn on a dime that way. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know, I just was something I've been meaning to ask you yeah. for like 20 years, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, like those, those characters, those figures, or maybe those archetypes, whatever we want to call them. Um, yeah, they can be expressed as tricksters, but you know, I always consider them more just agitators, you know, like yeah. in the same way that, the same way that paint needs an agitator to remain like something you can use, you know, or cement, you have to have an agitator in that to keep it liquid enough to pour. Um, you know, I never realized this either until I was reading Neil Gaiman's um, Norse mythology book. And in that Norse mythology book, you know, Loki is, you know, recurring character. He's always coming in to screw everything up like, as he does. But um, the, the way that Gaiman kind of stacked everything together, I guess, and drew a narrative line through it, you could see that the stories were the most vital when Loki was in the mix doing his pranks, his evil stuff, his wrong, his agitating, you know, when Loki kind of is captured in a cave or whatever it is, um, everything goes to sleep and gets cold and dies, you know? And I realized that um, when I was reading that book from Neil Gaiman, you know, delivering it as he delivers stuff that, um, that narrative needs those agitators. It needs these, um, these people who are gonna overturn and make fun of and question and push back um and like just be their crazy stupid selves like um on the road doesn't work without moriarty without dean moriarty he's that agitator you know and and so i do i maybe not since i read that you, you're probably right that i've been doing some version of it all along but i was doing it like more instinctually but now i realize that there that's actually a key component of narrative that we have to have that you know to keep things exciting to keep it where we can paint it on the wall if that makes sense but um as for genre you know how to jump back and forth or maybe how i do it anyways um like like this novel the only good indians um i knew it was a slasher going in because i i just wanted to write a slasher i wanted to see what would happen if you took jason Voorhees up to the reservation and hit him against some black feet you know but um when i was revising it um there was this one chapter in there where it, it's now the opening of the novel, the prologue where Ricky, um, something bad happens to Ricky anyway, is one of the characters. And that that initially in my first draft and really for a few drafts after that came at the, about the 60 or 65% mark. And when I was revising, I realized, wait, I can jump it ahead a chapter or I can move it back to two chapters. And the, nothing changed when I moved it. And I realized this is a free floating chapter. And so, I didn't know what to do with it. I thought maybe I should just cut this chapter because it doesn't lock into place. But then I got to thinking about the structure of the slasher and the slasher always starts with like two camp counselors um, making out behind the trees and somebody comes and hacks into them with a machete. And I realized, wait, we need a blood sacrifice up front. It's like, that's one of the, the, you have to have that. That's a convention of the genre, the slasher genre, which is to say 
genre gave me the scaffolding I needed to hang everything on. And so I just kind of like tilted the novel up and that chapter fell all the way to the front and became a prologue and it worked there. That was the only place I think it could have worked finally. And it signaled to the reader immediately that this is a slasher, or I think it did anyways. And I, and that it makes sense that the slasher would have evolved that way over its many iterations to tell itself as economically as it can by making that blood sacrifice, doing that signaling up front. So it, it developed for a reason, you know, it's not just random, random stuff, I don't think. And which is to say, every time I go into a genre, whether it's a small town crime novel, horror, science fiction, whatever, I, I always feel like I'm on a, a merry-go-round, a carousel, you know, with the horses and you hold on to the pole. Um, and I imagine that there's like six or eight big bells spaced around it. And my job when I'm in this genre, this science fiction genre, this horror genre, is to hold on to my pole and reach out as far as I can and hit that bell such that it makes noise. Those are the genre markers that I have to do. But in between those bells, I can do whatever I want. And that's kind of where the fun is for me, is doing the whatever I want parts, you know? So I feel like hitting those bells allow, it's like a suspension bridge, you know? It's like you've got a bell here and a bell here, if you're gonna hang stuff from bells, and you've got the sag in the middle where you can do whatever you want, you know? And I love those do whatever you want parts. That's the parts I live for, you know? Uh, and so, yeah, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I, I caught that, you know, reading, reading The Only Good Indians, uh, and I, you know, I was thinking about this, the structure of the book, and, and what it, one other thing it seemed to do, and maybe this is like, this is part of the genre as well, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in, you know, in that, you know, like, Jason Voorhees is, is, if not the protagonist, like, the a main character in a certain way, right? Mm -hmm. Like switching the way you switch from Ricky to Lewis, right? Signal that that that, that these guys aren't the main characters. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's the elk woman. Like these characters, you know, as much as we may come to look to like Lewis, mm -hmm. with his mm -hmm. you know fantasy novels and motorcycles and stuff, yeah. like he's disposable, and that it just ratchets up the stakes as as we go through the narrative. Yeah. Um, there's, there's one more question yeah, if you, yeah. if, uh, from, okay. yeah. from Tamara. Do you want to ask yeah. it, Tamara, yeah. or should I? You want me to do it? Okay. Uh, I have another question, if I may be so bold. Piggybacking off of something you said, there seems to be a lot of pressure on authors from marginalized communities to write with a socio-political bent. Mm -hmm. However, it seems that you've managed to write works that aren't bogged down with that ideology. What advice do you have to young writers from marginalized communities regarding their work and writing characters that are just people? I think that that's, that's the answer right there. Um, people always ask me, how do you struggle with representation? You know, how do you offer a corrective to, to this or that? And I'm like, I'm just trying to write real people as I know them. And that, that's the trick is just to write real people. And I guess, I mean, I can back off a bit and say, um, it's easy, at least with American Indian fiction, to write for the gatekeepers and the gatekeepers are the people who have this um, set of tools they've inherited from like two generations back that um, are customized for dealing with the politics of identity, with history, with um, poverty, with, with all, you know, all the different issues that people want to attach to, to American Indians. And um, if you write such that your work fits those tools, then they allow you to pass either into the review pages, the classrooms, whatever is good, you know, but it's not, that's not, that doesn't improve the genre any. If you, when you have gatekeepers on the genre, then the genre is not going to change because the gatekeepers have no reason to want it to change. You know, what you've got to do is just vault over those gatekeepers as good as well as you can and try to land in the market and live or die there, you know, which is a scary thing for sure, because you can flop around and find no readers, of course. But um, that's how things change too. And I'm all about things remaining vital or becoming vital, maybe both, I guess. And yeah, I think the way to do that is not to, um, not to write with the critics over your shoulder, write the things which matter to you. Like, you, you may be really interested in what's going to happen when we try to terraform Mars in 300 years, should we make it that long, you know, write about that. And um, if the critics still want to come at it with their old set of tools, they can probably find the um, struggle with um, representation or identity politics or whatever it is in there, you know, and maybe they'll be happy. But 
you don't have to satisfy them. You don't have to ask permission for them to get your book on the shelf. That's probably the most important thing I've learned anyways. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I'll just say, I just want to say, you know, um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Stephen Graham Jones for coming. Uh, you know, for zooming in uh, from your study to uh, read to us and talk with us tonight. Uh, it's been great to meet you and to uh, have you field our questions. Um, and it's just been, and you know, thank you even more. Thank you even more for you know the work the work you do. You're you're really you're a great storyteller, um, and it's amazing stuff. So. Um, yeah, uh, just a round of applause, I guess, on Zoom, however we do that, <laughs> right, with the little, the little, the little clapping, um, clap, 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 um, uh, thank you so much, thanks everybody for coming, um, yeah, it, it, any, any last words of, uh, uh, of wisdom or, or terror you want to send us away with, or, or, <laughs> Um, you know, I would say everybody should read Rebecca Runhorse's Black Sun. It comes out in October. That's a heck of a fantasy novel. It's a second okay. world fantasy novel in like a slightly different version of the Americas. And it just blew me away completely. I think we should all be looking forward to that book. And Rebecca thank y'all for having me. It was, it was so fun talking to y'all. It's my favorite part of the day so far. You know? Great. <laughs> Good. Well, I hope, I hope it stays a, a peak. Uh, great. Okay. And Rebecca Roan Horses, Black Sun. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Have a good night.